And, you know, sort of uh, just by starting by commenting on what the, the dean said at the very end, I see a lot of folks from my class of 1991, and I would just like to remind everybody there's a lot of mutual deterrence going on here. We all have secrets about each other, and we're all <laughs> nice and contained. Maybe later on tonight uh, we can talk about some, but, uh, but otherwise, good morning um, and, and thank you. Uh, when I was asked to do this um, a few months ago by Miel, there were two things that came to mind immediately. Uh, and the first is something that always comes to mind when I am ever asked to participate in an event or offer some words. And that is, once again, uh, people have vastly overestimated whatever I may have a value to say, and you're about to find that out the hard way. <laughs> um, and that always leans me towards considering whether to politely decline. But the second thing that came to mind when I was asked, and what prompted me to say yes, is in fact, the very first memory of my interaction with Northeastern Law School. And it's one of the few truly cosmic, surreal experiences I have had in my life. In 1988, I had applied to a bunch of law schools. I had been admitted to some, including Northeastern, uh, but I didn't know where I was going. And more importantly, I didn't know where I was going to go to law school because I didn't know how I was going to pay for law school. I had taken six years off between college and law school, and in 1988, six years later, and thinking about going to law school, I had saved a grand total of $2,000. <laughs> and I still owed on student loans from my days at UMass, and I was really concerned that no school was going to give me financial aid. And I was very nervous about this, and at the time I was working at City Hall in the Fair Housing Commission as an investigator. And I recall one morning in late spring of 1988, sitting at my desk and just stressing about what was going to happen and was I in fact going to finally enroll at law school and um, get my parents off my back. And as I was sitting there, the phone rang and the person on the end asked for me and I said it was myself and she identified herself as Joan Gibran. And I didn't know who Joan Gibran was, but she said, I am the Dean of Admissions at Northeastern Law School. And so this was back in the day when you might get a phone call from the Dean of a law school. But I said, okay, and we started talking and she said, have you decided where you're gonna go to law school yet? And I said, no, I, I haven't figured that out. And she said, would you consider going to Northeastern Law School if we were to offer you a generous financial aid package? <laughs> and I said, yes, I would. <laughs> And the rest is history. <laughs> uh, and it truly happened just like that. So while I am still a little ambivalent about the notion of having somebody like me up here talking to you at a function like this, the deal I sort of made with the gods was I have to say yes, like 75% of the time whenever I'm asked to do something. So this is one of those 75%. Um, but with that, I am very happy to be here. I, I still wonder if there are things I can say of value to such a broad and diverse group. Uh, but I thought that given the reunion as a backdrop, uh, I might use this as, as an opportunity to uh, reflect on a few ways that Northeastern has meaningfully impacted me and to share a few observations that I've made along the way that continue to guide me all these years later that are tied to my days at Northeastern. Uh, and the first is an observation about Northeastern. I don't think it's going to be lost on anybody in this room, but it's one that I think is just not mentioned enough. Um, I have never taken for granted the environment that the school created around us as they went about teaching us the law. Everybody knows about Northeastern's public interest bent. Everybody knows about the co-op program, but I don't think the school has always gotten the credit it should get for the humane way the faculty went about teaching us. Uh, back in the late 80s, we had this really interesting mix of enlightened intellectuals with very different personalities. Some were traditional, some were a bit unorthodox, um, but everybody was dedicated, everybody was authentic, Everybody was committed. 
And I have in mind our then beloved Dean, Dan Gevelber, um, the old school style, but big hearted David Hall, uh, the eternally irreverent Steve Subrin, and I'm going to leave it just like that. Uh, the very genteel Tom Campbell and Bob Hogring. The tough but fair, but tough, Wendy Parmet. <laughs> um, and then this group of indefatigable relative youngsters like Brooke Baker, uh, Margaret Wu, and Deborah Ramirez. And I recall this environment that was so supportive and collegial. And as students, we were in it together. It never felt competitive. At least for me, it never felt competitive with anything that we were doing. And I recall one instructive example of this, or illustrative example of this, is during first year, if you remember, we had legal practice. And we had that issue that we all had to work on involving invitees and licensees and somebody entering an apartment and injuring themselves. And at one point, it culminated in mock oral arguments that we had to do in the evening. And they brought in everybody to mock judge the argument. Well, when we did that, uh, I and my partner were, were on one side. I forget who. Uh, I know one of the other two on the other side was Mindy Garris from our class. I forget who the under, other individual was. But when it was my turn, I got up to make my argument. And I was really, really nervous. And I was so nervous that I began sweating. And when I began sweating, the only thing I could think about was the fact that I am sweating. <laughs> and the more I focused on the fact that I was sweating, the more self-conscious I got, and the more I sweat. And by the time I sat down, I was just a wet mess. <laughs> and as soon as I sat down, I just all of a sudden spied something coming out of the corner of my eye, and I turned, and a packet of Kleenex hit me right on the side of the face. And Mindy Garris, my opponent, um, took mercy on me and just saw the state I was in and just threw a packet of Kleenex over to me to wipe my face. And I thought, okay, that's embarrassing, but how nice is that? <laughs> now, I recall teachers who were always probing, and passionate and who wanted to get us to engage and think critically about things and share our thoughts in class. But I don't recall ever feeling pressured or belittled or embarrassed or as though offering a wrong answer was bad. The time I spent at Northeastern, particularly with respect to first year, was so far removed from what I the image I had going in based on Scott Turow's 1L and the paper chase, that for a while, seriously, I thought there was something wrong with the school or something <laughs> wrong with me. And it just took me a while to appreciate that the school had simply figured out you can teach law in a user-friendly way. And as I look forward from that experience, uh, clearly Northeastern has greatly impacted me personally and professionally. Uh, in terms of the personal impact, it is impossible for me to overstate the school's impact on my life. It starts with acknowledging this is the place where I met and fell in love with one of my classmates, Amy Hudspeth. And we got married in 1992. Uh, the year after graduation, and we will celebrate our 30th anniversary next year. Uh, the key to a successful marriage, by the way, uh, we work in completely different fields of uh, the law. Um, our lives, our professional lives, actually rarely interact. Uh, she has worked most of her time in healthcare. We have very completely different styles in how we practice and engage in the world. Uh, we don't always agree on things. Um, but, as I said at my investiture, investiture ceremony in 2015, when I first became a judge, um, she is Northeastern to the core. She has always been there for me. Our respective victories and challenges have always been shared. She's cheer-led for me. She's defended me without fail. And she's been that voice in my ear that sometimes you don't want to listen to, but you 
need to listen to, even if it's talking a little loud. And if I am here today because I've accomplished anything, um, equal things must go to her. Now, beyond that, we just had a great class. Um, it needs to be said. So many close friendships were formed uh, that have lasted throughout the years, and I've been blessed to attend the weddings of many classmates. We've been able over the years to meet up, though not often enough. And I've also been an ardent supporter of the co-op program for 25 years or so, and I have met and interacted with so many students who have gone on to graduate and grow up and become friends. And so I have this vast network of friends out there who are uh, uh, directly from my time at Northeastern. Professionally, the impact has been equally huge. When I entered Northeastern, um, I was truly, utterly directionless. I really was. And the school gave me structure through the co-op program. I always knew I wanted to be a lawyer. I always knew I wanted to be a litigator because of Perry Mason and what we would see on TV. But that was all I knew. And I grew up in a wonderful middle class household with very grounded and very moral parents. But neither of my parents had the sorts of backgrounds or experiences that I could look to for guidance in trying to define how to go about pursuing a career in law. Um, the, the co-op program gave me four wonderful opportunities to experiment, to test, and to figure out what I might be interested in, because I really, really had no sense of intuition when it came to making um, sound decisions about my career. I mean, this is a bit of a con confessional, but it's true. And I'll give you an example of how adrift I was. When we were doing the summer associate experience back in 1989 at the beginning of second year, um, I had some interviews. And some of the firms gave me an offer to come back as a summer associate, but I really had no clue on how to go about assessing the firms and how to make a decision. We had a classmate, Londia McCafferty, now chief judge of the district court in New Hampshire, who I always thought was one of the smartest and nicest people on planet Earth. And Londia told me she had gotten an offer from Choate Hall, and she was going to go to Choate Hall and Choate Hall was on State Street at the time in this sheer glass building that we called the Darth Vader building. And I thought that was the coolest building in the city of Boston. And if Londia was gonna go there, that was just icing on the cake. But I remember, so I said, all right, I'm gonna go to Choate Hall too. If you're going, I'm going to Choate Hall. And I went home and I told my non-law school roommates in Jamaica Plain, but I was going to be working next summer in the Darth Vader building, and everybody was duly impressed. Nobody knew what firm I was going to. It didn't matter. Uh, and then, about a week later, Londia called me to say she had changed her mind. <laughs> and she wasn't going to choke anymore. She was going to go to Hale and Door. And I had gotten an offer from Hale and Door as well uh, for a summer associate, and I was really disappointed but I thought long and hard and said, I just have to go where Londia is going because <laughs> Londia knows best. So I didn't go to the Darth Vader building and I ended up going to Hale and Door. And inertia being what it is, in time, uh, Hale and Door made me an offer uh, and that's where I went after graduation. But I've had a blessed career, um, all mistakes and fortuity and happenstance aside. And I give all of the credit to Northeastern uh, as was noted, I spent my first four years at these two firms, both of which were co-ops that I had had. And at Hale and Door, where I spent my first two years, I could go to Harry Daniels, who was sitting right there, who was not only a Northeastern alum, but was the only partner of color at the firm. And there was somebody I could directly go to when I had any questions and I wanted guidance. When I left Hale and Door and went to Prince Lobel two years later, my mentor there was a guy named Bill Worth, also a Northeastern alum. And Bill ended up becoming a very good friend. He went to our wedding, and I remained friends with him throughout the years. And those experiences are what enabled me to then move to the job 
that I'd always wanted where I could finally indulge my desire to be in a courtroom. And so as noted, in 1995, I joined the U.S. Attorney's Office here in Boston as a prosecutor. And I'd like to note this only because I think in some quarters, um, there are still some folks who continue to worry that being a prosecutor is somewhere incompatible with being a Northeastern grad. And I always vehemently disagree. Uh, and I tell people that uh, what I took from Northeastern was a strong sense of ethics and respect for others and a belief in the fair application of the law. And to be honest, I think it made me a much better prosecutor, uh, particularly when it came to my charging decisions and my sentencing recommendations. Um, it's also worth noting when I went to the U.S. Attorney's Office, um, it marked a continuing trend that was very discouraging to my family and my parents where I took a salary cut at each of the jobs. <laughs> I so I went down from Hale and Dora to Prince Lobel to the U.S. Attorney's Office. My dad, who usually stayed out of my business, called me to say, I don't think that's the way it's supposed to work. <laughs> But overall, I was with the department for about 20 years, and as noted, towards the end of the tenure, we got the opportunity to work in France for a couple of years through the department's Office of International Affairs, which is also a co-op employer, as I understand it. And so I worked at the embassy um, looking out for DOJ's interests in France, and I worked with French counterparts on certain types of cases. And you know, I can make a joke and say somebody has to do this job, but uh, it was as heady as it sounds, and it was the most fantastic uh, experience. They gave us this beautiful, huge apartment in a really nice section of the city. Uh, our kids got to ride to the American school every day on a luxury bus. Um, and here's the great part, because we did so much walking everywhere, you could eat whatever you wanted without gaining weight. <laughs> Um, but there are really three things about my experience in France that are notable and that continue to guide me somewhat uh, today. Um, first and probably the most illuminating was this, this realization that we all sometimes use the same words when we are talking to each other, but we're not talking about the same thing. And in particular, uh, given the sorts of cases that we were working on, we were always bandying about these lofty terms like liberty, civil liberties, and freedom, and justice with our French counterparts, all thinking we were talking about the same things. But I came to find out oftentimes we had completely different things in mind when we were talking about these terms. When I got to France, um, I would walk down the street. And in Paris, you would see roving military groups, usually in groups of four, um, armed, in uniform, with machine guns, just walking around, just, just keeping the peace. Also, if you're walking down the street in Paris or anywhere in France, in theory, an officer can come up to you and stop you and say, show me your papers, and you must. And also, periodically, we would see and we would read about somebody being prosecuted for making a disparaging remark about Jews or questioning the Holocaust. And all of this struck the French as that's standard, that's reasonable. And when I told a French counterpart that all of this would run very counter to our notion of civil liberties, that we don't have our military just wandering around with machine guns out, we don't usually let the police stop people and talk to them without having a basis to do so, and we usually let people say very vile things um, and view that as a, as a freedom of speech. Um, what I was generally told was, well, you weren't occupied by the Nazis in World War II, and we don't have an ocean separating us from the terrorists. And we know that words can lead to action. So their concepts evolved completely differently based on their history and geography. And this observation has resonated with me because it underscores how important it is sometimes to look beyond simple words when I am dealing with parties or when parties are arguing about something um, to focus not on the word itself, but to focus on what it means to those who framed the rule or the word or wrote the words or the person invoking it. 
Oftentimes, the disputes we have are not really about the words itself, but about understandings of what that means. And as a judge, this has always been very helpful for me to have in my mind. The second and third, I said there were three notable things. The second and third are, are related. They're brief, but they're notable because each involved my interacting with a sitting Supreme Court justice, which can be really scary for a lawyer. And both of these taught me something. Um, the first of these involved an interaction with Justice Stephen Breyer. Um, Justice Stephen Breyer, if you don't know, is a true Francophile. Uh, he speaks many different languages. Um, now that I'm a judge, he often spends time in the courthouse and he comes down to the gym and he puts on headphones and he's always teaching himself a new language. So when he's on the treadmill, he's always listening to lessons and spitting the words back out. First time I actually thought he was talking to me and I realized he was just saying, how are you in Portuguese? But, <laughs> but he is a renowned intellectual. And in 2013, he was being inducted into one of the most prestigious arts, arts academies in France. And it was really a great honor. It was really a big deal. This is a, a society where once you are a member, you are a member for life. They will only induct a new member when another member has passed away. So it's very rare to have somebody uh, inducted. So he came over to Paris to, for this ceremony. I met him when he was at the embassy. And after he left, uh, but before the ceremony itself, uh, folks in the embassy came to me and they said, listen, we want you to go to the ceremony itself. I'm like, okay, happy to do that. That'll be interesting. And they said, all right, but here's, here's a little bit more. Um, he's going to be giving a 45 minute speech in French on some esoteric subject relating to French and American law. He has given us a copy of his speech in advance. We want you to read it and vet it and make sure it's okay. And I, and so I, I sat down and I said, are, do, I, do I understand this right? You are asking me, Don Cabell, a uh, low, lowly DOJ person here, to vet a Supreme Court justice's speech. And he said, yes, we want, we want you to do that. And I said, well, what happens if I think there's a problem? Um, I said, well, we may have to take it up with the justice, but we'll wait to hear back from you first. So I said, all right. And um, I walked away. And of course, I realized I was thoroughly unqualified to review the speech of Justice Breyer, um, let alone a speech that was intended for the luminaries of French intellectual, intellectual society. So I took the speech. I went to my office. I closed the door to my office. I put the speech right on the corner of my desk. I put on some nice mellow music. And then for the next three hours, I took a nice long nap. <laughs> and when the nap was over, I uh, turned the music off. I came out with the speech and I said to the ambassador, this speech looks great. <laughs> so it's okay. And so the moral of the story is, is twofold. Uh, one is sometimes you just gotta trust your instincts and do nothing and lie about it. <laughs> The other is one that Professor Denise Cardibania, may she rest in peace, told us in first year, which is when in doubt, sleep. <laughs> uh, the second encounter I had involved Justice Anthony Kennedy. And this was also in 2013. Uh, this is before Ogerfell or any of the, the major ones that he wrote in his last years. But he was in Paris for some various events and he came to visit the embassy. And while I was there, uh, folks in the embassy came to me and they said, you know, we'd like you to shepherd him around. Just sort of, you know, walk around with him so there's somebody with him for the day. And of course, I was very nervous about doing that. But he was, in fact, just a very down-to-earth, very nice person. Think of a grandfatherly type of person who dotes on his kids. He showed me pictures of his family. Just a wonderful individual. And at one point, we sat down and we just started talking. And among other things, he expressed concern to me about where the country was headed. He saw increasingly this breakdown in civility among people and communities. And it bothered him that people were tending to look to the courts for relief and for resolution 
whenever there was a conflict. And he said something to me that resonates more with me now as a judge. He said, people keep wanting us to solve their problems, but just because we can act doesn't mean we should act. He said, if someone in the neighborhood is displaying a disturbing sign in their yard, the solution is not to take the neighbor to court. The solution is to have the other neighbors who are bothered by the sign go and shame the neighbor into, review, into, into removing it from their yard. It's cheaper, it's quicker, and it's more effective. And I thought, yes, that's brilliant. Um, so I then returned from France in late 2014, and as noted, I was selected uh, for this job a few months later. <clears throat> Fast forward, I'm now nearing the end of my seventh year, and I like to think a lot of my style and behavior and priorities have been informed by my time at Northeastern and by my experiences. Um, when litigants and parties come before me, not so much the lawyers, but the actual people involved in the case itself, um, I try to put myself in their shoes. I try to imagine that they are unfamiliar with the workings of the court and with certain words that we typically use, and I try to demystify things for them and explain things to them, especially in criminal cases. When it comes to law students and lawyers who are making their way and looking for advice, I try to channel the mentors I had, like Harry Daniels and Bill Worth and so many others. And I have a policy that I will meet with any student from any school who reaches out to me for advice. And I try to be mindful that whatever authority I may have as a judge, it's all the more effective and respected when it's used judiciously. And it's a source of pride for me that I've been uh, very successful in helping a lot of parties to avoid protracted and costly litigation by mediating their cases with them rather than having the case go on for years to trial. So I want to thank you for your intention um, this morning, but in closing, I do want to share two final thoughts from my vantage point. Um, first, the demographics of the country have changed dramatically. Um, our population is now more of color than anything else, and women now outnumber men at American colleges and universities. But our profession remains one that is still predominantly white. It's still one that seems to place a lot of emphasis on pedigree and subjective rankings, and it's still one where men seem to be there in those key moments more than women. And I know that many good people have been coming together for years to address these sorts of issues. And it would be wrong to say that no progress has been made, but it would be wrong also to say that we've turned the corner. Um, I tend to not even be aware. Most of the time, I'm usually the only person of color in the courtroom or at a gathering, um, not because we're all colorblind, but because it's the status quo I've been used to as long as I've been in this profession. Um, I wrote down these rough notes to use as a guide. When I started law school in 1988 in our class, I think we had about 10 students of color out of about 160 students. And I understood at the time that actually represented a pretty good increase from years prior. When I started at Hale and Door, in 1991, and Harry can correct me if I'm wrong, I think we had a total of about five attorneys of color out of about 250 attorneys or so. When I went to the US Attorney's Office in 1995, we had about six attorneys of color out of about 125 attorneys. And when I think of the judiciary just here in Boston, um, and considering active and senior status judges, we have about four judges of color out of about 30 or so judges. There's a lot to do. And every time I have a hearing, one of the things I do is I look up the firms where the lawyers are from. And just go down the list and just to gauge what it's like of those firms. And I have to say the numbers are equally small 
at the firms that I see. We've been challenged in the, in the judiciary to consider what we can do to promote diversity and inclusiveness. And there are some programs in place, but I would challenge anyone listening today to consider marshalling whatever influence you may have to hasten the progress we need to make in this area. Whether it's hiring, recruitment, or mentoring, uh, or something else. Um, I'm, I'm not especially innovative, so I'm not here to say today what people should do, um, but I know that more of us need to do more than we are doing. And I will note that as I say these words and as I look at Harry, I am reminded that when we had our reunion, our last reunion, maybe five years ago, um, Harry had a similar message stated more passionately and more urgently. Um, so the need is there. The last thing I want to do is just stress more for those who are still ascending professionally the importance of persistence. Um, I have met with so many people in so many impressive positions who quietly tell me while we are, we are talking that they had to try more than once to get to that spot uh, before they got their dream job. And it strikes me that we tend not to tout our rejections or our failed attempts, uh, but I think there's a value in letting young lawyers know and others know that when someone says no to you, that's just a moment in time. It doesn't have to be the end of the story. Uh, I did not get to France uh, the first time I applied for it. I did not become a judge the first time I applied to become a judge. Uh, if it's worth it to you, it's worth trying for again and again. Thank you very much. Give him a couple of minutes to answer questions. Not that you have to have one. <laughs> Not that you have one. Don't be shy. There is one. There is one? Oh, it's Chad. I was going to say if it's Chad, um, it usually needs to be a disclaimer or something before. How are you, sir? I figured you'd only recognize me if I was sitting back here. So <laughs> <laughs> um, tell us about the if, if there's a single trend um, in litigation, we talk about um, kind of breakdowns in society done. How much more hostile are people um, in the courtroom? Talk about civility, um, whatever trend you want to you want to identify. Uh, I, I do think it's very, uh, at least for me, it's very apparent that um, there is less civility now between lawyers than before. Now, interestingly, Older lawyers, there comes a certain point where it seems to me older lawyers kind of get over it. But for those in the middle of the pack who still feel that they need to show some sort of testosterone, um, it is very, very, very um, stressful. It's very hostile. We spend a lot of time sitting with parties um, and in, a, in a very nice way because they don't like to embarrass anybody, but just trying to explain why something that was filed was just completely unnecessary could have been resolved with a phone call. And it seems the more and more that the first recourse is to the courts. And this is exactly what um, Justice Kennedy was sort of getting at. Of course, there it's on a grander scale. But yes, um, we deal with a lot of conflict that should not be in court. Yes, Val? <laughs> You mentioned that you were uh, that you have an open door policy. You'll be with anybody. So, student. Um, any student, right? So, a student walks in and is deciding to go to two law schools, Northeastern and an elite school. Um, and when Another I say, elite school. <laughs> <laughs> You also recognize that pedigree still matters. I yes. think that's what he said. Yes. So with that said, and the person is either a 
woman or a person of color. And to further add, they look at you and they say, I want to become a judge. I actually want to be a judge on the Supreme Court. Right. What would you recommend to that student? I can tell you honestly, I would never, ever, ever recommend to somebody what school they should select over another school. I, I, I just won't do it. I think it's very subjective. I will say this, I think people need to know themselves, people need to figure out what they want to do, and people can re reasonably assume that they may be better positioned at one school as opposed to another school, given their background and given what they want to do. But I think that's more at the margins. I think for the majority of, majority of us, we fall in that big heartland in the middle where hard work, great interpersonal skills, uh, account for way more than the school you go to. It was always told to me when I first came out by Bill Worth, of all people, and I think this is true. Five years out of law school, nobody cares where you went to law school. And that's the way it generally works at the judiciary. I also, I think here's a positive trend. More and more and more and more judges are looking less and less and less at Harvard and Yale and NYU or wherever for their clerkships, and even the Supreme Court, and are willing to look beyond to other schools. So I know the point you're, you're making. I don't disagree that somebody may choose for the right reasons that going to a school like Harvard and Yale or Yale is going to give them more than going to you know, another school. But I, I think that's a personal choice. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes. I have a very practical question. You mentioned that you take pride in assisting people in resolving cases at an early stage. Now, if I had a civil rights case pending in the U.S. District Court, uh, how could I get it referred to you for mediation? <laughs> it's, we, I, uh, it's so simple. You just go to the court, the, the judge who has the case, and say, we'd like to have this mediated, send it to Judge Cabell. And they will. Yeah. It's that simple. Thank you. You're welcome. Hope to see you soon. <laughs> <laughs>